It's my absolute pleasure and honor to welcome our opening keynote speaker. So Dr. Daniel Coleman has long been fascinated by the poetic power of the narrative arts. Um, to generate uh, of the, pow the power of the narrative arts to generate a sense of place, community, critical social engagement and mindfulness, uh, and especially wonder. As a reader, writer and teacher, he's compelled by the long, slow project of unlearning naturalized injustices and sanctioned ignorance uh, uh, and sanctioned ing ignorance and is uh, witness to the fact that the fact that fresh ways to learn still occur and have transformative power. Although he has committed considerable efforts in learning uh, in and from the natural world, he's still a bookish, bookish person who loves to the learning, who loves the learning that is essential to writing. He has written scholarly books about literature, masculinity, migration, and whiteness in Canada. And he has written literary, literary nonfiction books about his upbringing among missionaries in Ethiopia, uh, about the spiritual and cultural practices of reading, and about the eco-human relationships in Hamilton, Ontario. Um, the post-industrial city where he lives in the, Nash, the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas of the New Credit. He has edited books on early Canadian literature, cultures, post-colonial masculinities, race, Caribbean Canadian literature, the states of human, the state of the humanities in Canada and Canadian universities, the creativity uh, and resilience of refugee and, and indig indigenous people, and international scholarship on Canadian literatures. He loves being, and last but not least, he loves being the co-director with his friend and colleague Lorraine York of CCENA, McMaster Center for Community Engaged Innovative Arts. All right. So now that you know a little bit about Daniel, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce him as, and his keynote address, uh, What I'm Learning from Wantum About Relating to Knowledge as Living or Dead. Welcome, Daniel. So um, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you for the invitation to be here with you at the Kapala Conference. I'm grateful to Caitlin and to Carly and the Kapow Conference for inviting me to speak and explaining the conference theme to me over email and things like that. And to Ariel for helping me with the logistics of actually getting here to the conference. I'm really grateful to be here on the shore of Lake Ontario where many indigenous peoples have met and encountered one another for centuries. The Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee in particular formed the dish with one spoon wampum agreement in this region. I'm holding up a replica of the wampum made by Ken Miracle of Six Nations. He's got a place called the Mer the I was going to say the Miracle Shop. I mean the wampum shop. <laughs> His name is Miracle. I'll pass these around in a minute. Um, so this agreement was made pre-European arrival in the region to share the region in peace with rivaling peoples. And the idea of the spoon in the dish was that there would be no knife or there would be no bloodshed. And so when the French arrived at this end of Lake Ontario, they called the people who lived in this region neutral, la nation neutre. Um, that wasn't their name for themselves, but because of this peace agreement, they understood that they were in a neutral territory, a place of peace where the, the provision of the region would be available to all. Um, so that there would be no bloodshed and people could share safety, food, and shelter in the region. We live, we are gathering today downstream from that agreement. And it is wampum that I, as a white Canadian settler, scholar of British and Scandinavian ancestry, am here to talk about today. What I'm learning from wampum about relating to knowledge as living or dead. I'm a newcomer to this region, having only lived here for 26 years, I guess, and being introduced to wampum only 17 years ago. So there are likely people in the room who know much more about these matters than I do. And so I ask for your indulgence as I talk about my own learning curve in wampum studies and how it's reshaping my understanding of what knowledge is and what learning is all about. I'm hoping that by talking about what I'm learning from wampum as a living practice, as a way of reminding us of the river flow of history into the present, that I'll be able to share uh, some reflections that will be relevant to the, your conference theme, sowing seeds for change, growing the practice of ac academic librarianship. 
I'm really conscious of being here because there are librarians and because there are libraries. All of the research I've done my whole career has been fueled and fed by the work you do. Uh, I wouldn't be here and having anything to say if it wasn't for the, the collection and the making available of those records of past things, but also of contemporary things that have been so important to my own learning curve over many years. So this is also a statement of gratitude to the work that you do. I love this image of Seeds for Change and the image of not just preserving a practice, but growing in, into its future. As the conference organizers put it, this theme will focus on how we affect needed change in the discipline, particularly as it re quite relates to equity and diversity and inclusion. The theme also invites us to consider the, right, how we build structures that inspire and support growth as much as we tend to the seeds of change that we grow. And I know that the conference organizers were wanting to interact with the larger themes of Congress uh, as a whole, where Congress organizers say, what might it mean for us to commit to knowing and caring for each other across our differences? Understanding that the world we want to live in tomorrow is dependent on the actions that we take together today. Can we reimagine a new set of social relationships grounded in decoloniality, anti-racism, justice, and the preservation of Earth? So I'm hoping I can contribute to your collective thoughts in these directions by reflecting on my ongoing learning process that has grown out of my moving to a job at McMaster University in 1997 to teach Canadian literature in the English department there. And very early in my arrival from Western Canada to Hamilton, encountering the lively and flourishing community of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe scholars and students in the Hamilton region. What I'm going to do is to pass around these wampum replicas. So I've already held this one up. It's the dish with one spoon. If you haven't seen wampum before, just to feel what it's like and to see how it's made with uh, these are wampum that are made from, uh, uh, you know, contemporary resin plastic beads, but they were originally made from seashells. And I'll talk about how they were made in a little bit. They're held together by um, like a, a sinew, uh, strong sinew thread. And I'll pass this one into the middle. This is called the covenant chain uh, of friendship. And this third one is called the two row uh, wampum, the, often known as the Degani Gaswenta, Degani Dohade Gaswenta. In I'm using Genyangahaga terms for these, uh, the Mohawk language, but um, the Six Nations who have a long tradition of wampum uh, keeping and, and messaging um, are native Six Nations, but have six languages. So there are different terms for these wampums. So maybe I'll just begin by talking about my introduction to wampum. Oh, and while I'm passing these around, if I mention the wampum, the dish with one spoon wampum, and you happen to have it in your hand, if you don't mind holding it up for everybody to see at that moment, or if I mention the covenant chain, if you would mind holding that up for everybody to see, that will just this will go on throughout the um, throughout the talk. So back in the early 1980s, I was doing a master's degree in English at the University of Regina. And I got a contract teaching job with what was known as the SIFC, the Saskatchewan Indian Federated College of the time today, First Nations University. And the indigenous writers we studied in those classes fascinated me. And I wondered if perhaps I would do a PhD in indigenous literatures at the time. Reading indigenous authors in the 1980s confronted me with challenges that I, of about what I assume to be knowledge, what I assume to be true. Are the laws and constitution of my country truly legal? Was the school curricula we studied truly our history and our uh, curricula for knowledge? When indigenous writers treat animals or plants as sentient thinking beings with spirit, what does this mean about the science I had learned that placed humans at the pinnacle of evolution, let alone at the forefront of civilization, which we understood as through a term like progress. 
these questions made me wonder, how, how do I know what I know? And what is the nature of the knowledge I maintain or keep or learn? If plants and animals have spirit, <clears throat> as so many of the indigenous thinkers I was reading in those classes and teaching in those classes insisted, what does this mean about the way I have been taught to think? What about the stability or fixity of the supposed objects of my knowledge? While these questions intrigued and challenged me at the time, I did not end up pursuing a PhD in Indigenous literatures. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, we had the rising debates around appropriation and cultural appropriation. Maybe some of you remember those days, sparked by Indigenous writers and thinkers at the time, raising widespread concern about the long history of extractive scholarship and writing where non-Indigenous writers and scholars built expertise and reputations based on stories and knowledge extracted from Indigenous cultures. During those times, non-Indigenous writers and scholars were told to stop stealing Native stories and to allow Indigenous thinkers and writers to convey these stories and knowledges in ways that benefited Indigenous communities and within the context of living Indigenous cultures. And in a time such as that, I felt that respect for Indigenous peoples and knowledge was meant to keep out. So I did a PhD instead on the literature of migration and diaspora, which was much closer to my own experience of moving from Ethiopia, where I'd grown up as a child, to Canada when I was 18 years old. So this is the context in which <clears throat> I arrived from Treaty 4, Treaty 6 territory on the Canadian prairies as a new assistant professor at McMaster in 1997 with a PhD in the literature of diaspora. And while I remained deeply interested in Indigenous literatures, and I even supervised local Indigenous students completing their degrees in Indigenous studies, I felt that respect means that these emerging Indigenous scholars should take the lead in conducting research on Indigenous subjects. And those Indigenous PhDs are now my faculty colleagues. I'll be quoting from some of them today. Uh, conducting their own research in Indigenous studies at my university and others. And I look back now at those years and think that was a good approach to support the growing strength and authority of Indigenous people's own scholarship and not work in the field directly myself. Hello. There it goes. Thank you. Nonetheless, things changed for me on April 20th, 2006. I was walking to work as usual one morning to the office, and I saw 30 Ontario provincial police cars parked on campus behind one of the student residences, Mary Kai's student residence, and I was startled to see them. But I thought, oh, it's April, students have gone home for the spring summer, so the police are having some kind of convention or something. And uh, that's why there's so many police cars on campus. And it was only later in the day that I learned that McMaster, my university, was housing the 200 police officers armed with M16s and tasers that raided the site at Caledonia, just out of Douglas Creek Estate, outside of Caledonia, the rest of the grandmothers, the children, and, uh, elders, young people who were protesting that the building of a housing estate on the edge of the town of Caledonia between the town and the reserve of Six Nations on the Grand River. So the Six Nations, if you're not from the region, are called themselves the Haudenosaunee, which means that they are, the phrase itself means they are building the long house, they are building the house. And the idea of the Confederacy when it was first formed long before Europeans arrived was that each of the nations that agree, agreed to join the way of peace brought their own rafter into the longhouse. So there were six rafters in the longhouse. And those who had agreed to join the way of peace thereafter would add their own rafters to the longhouse. It was an expansive vision of Confederacy peacemaking that preceded European arrival in the region. And part of that uh, set of agreements was that they developed Wampum agreements, such as the dish with one spoon. Somebody's got it in their hand. People came in a bit late. If you end up with the dish with one spoon in your hand, can you hold it up for everybody to see? There it is. Thank you. 
Um, the covenant chain of friendship, that's around here somewhere too. There it is. For those of you who came in later, please have a chance to have a look. These are replicas made by Ken Miracle of Six Nations and the two row wampum, which is back here. Thank you. Um, these are all alliance agreement making wampum. Most of the Confederacy, because of the covenant chain and the two row wampum, I'll talk about these in a little bit more detail, uh, sided with the, had made those agreements with the British and therefore sided with the British during the Revolutionary War. And uh, when the British side were driven out of the territory, the Haudenosaunee were driven out of their traditional lands south of Lake Ontario, and many ended up on the Grand River in British territory, which is why 20 minutes from where I live was one of the most populated reserves in Canada and why there was conflict over land uh, provenance from my house and why the police were on campus to enforce Canadian insistence about who's landing who in the region. So the Douglas Creek's estate's land dispute traced right back to these agreements. And the reason I was introduced to wampum in such a visceral way was that people kept pointing to the two row, you can see the banner that's been made as a replica of the two row idea um, in the slide here, were proclaimed that Canadians don't know our original agreement. And we need to know these things in order to understand why Haudenosaunee people were insisting that Canadian law and property law doesn't apply as it, we assume that it would. What are the legal pro protocols around law man or uh, legal land tenure and so on that apply in our region? So um, I witnessed this conflict unfold right within my university. And so, as I say, I had felt that respect means keep out. And then that was such a visceral experience of feeling like the institution where I work is part of this system of enforcing not just the law around land uh, ownership and land regulation, but also our knowledge about it. And what is the history of our region? What are the agreements that have been made in this area? So. My university's barracksing of the police constituted such a strong experience of there is no respectful outside where I can remain somehow un, uh, un involved in these kinds of uh, debates and discussions and conflict, physical conflicts uh, that were happening in my region. My own students couldn't come safely to campus from the Six Nations during that time because of the police presence and so on. There wasn't a neutral spectator zone. During this conflict, as I say, the two-row wampum was very often upheld. And among the various agreements that I passed out wampum for us to think about, the two-row got mentioned a lot because the image of those two rows was conveyed from a 16, early 1600s agreement with the Dutch when they arrived in the Hudson River system. And the Haudenosaunee met them on the river and said, these white background beads, if you want to call it that way, represent the river that you have arrived on, the river of life that we share. But if we're going to share it in a healthy way, you don't have to lose your language and take Haudenosaunee Residential School. You can keep your own language in your sailing ship, and we'll keep our own language and culture and beliefs in our canoe. And these parallel paths will be bound together by the three beads of respect, friendship, and trust here peace, friendship, and respect. So the white sections aren't this background. They're the river of life itself, and they represent this uh, respectful bonding between these two parallel, not joining paths. And so the idea was we'll keep our culture and belief active and alive, and you keep your culture and belief and law active and alive. You can share and come into our region, um, but we'll respect each other's traditions. The agreement was to link arms in peace, friendship, and respect. And the respect mean, meant retaining each other's cultural and political autonomy as a central value for the alliance. What is knowledge? If you've never heard of an event or a principle or a concept, as I had never really encountered this particular set of principles, knowledges, uh, events, concepts, 
until I moved into the region. How can you relate to that knowledge? How, how can you engage with that knowledge? In, in my case, it took a public conflict over a colonial history and its ongoing effects in my city, in my university with people I knew for me to realize that there was a whole world of information, facts, ways of proceeding, cultural norms, ways of passing on this knowledge that I had no previous idea about. And yet the world of knowledge was shaped, of that knowledge was shaping everything around me from the idea of owning title to land, to treaty history, to what my university student residences can be used for. Right around then, I was asked by Rick Montour, who was doing his PhD with me, a Mohawk student at the time, to take on the role as, at McMaster to be academic co-chair of the President's Committee on Indigenous Issues, which basically dealt with um, facilitating uh, conversations and relationships between Indigenous students and Indigenous communities and uh, our, our uh, university administration and practices. And I found myself in a meeting very early on to establish an Indigenous Knowledge Center at the Grand River Territory, Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. And the meeting was being guided by knowledge guardians, elders like Lottie Key and Hubert Sky, Ima Johnson. And they said we should call this new center De Ohahage, which means two roads with two paths in Cayuga language, which clearly is a representation of where's the two row wampum? It was somewhere back here before. There it is. The two row wampum, Deo Hahage, the two roads are two paths. And they were saying that the center should bring together the best of Haudenosaunee and Western methods to preserve and regenerate Haudenosaunee knowledge for future generations. Western methods that Kapal members would be familiar with, like cataloging books and files, creating physical and electronic archives, and Indigenous methods like recognizing fluent language speakers and herbal medicine practitioners who may or may not have advanced university degrees as the equivalent of their PhDs, the doctors of Haudenosaunee philosophy who could guide the way people would relate to Haudenosaunee knowledge. So this is a picture from the recognition ceremony of people being recognized as what they call indigenous knowledge guardians, their PhDs to guide uh, the research development of the Deo Hohage Center. These elders understood knowledge as something that lives and grows in relationship. And they understood that the Western sailing ship had something to contribute to the regeneration and future life of Haudenosaunee knowledge. Our steering committee then hired Rick Hill, a Tuscarora art historian who had been involved in wampum recovery work since the 1970s to serve as the Ohahagi's first senior research coordinator. And many of the photographs I have of wampum on these slides are Rick's uh, photographs of wampum gradually being returned, uh, that had been returned from various museum institutions to uh, the Six Nations Confederacy over time. Throughout previous positions that Rick had held at the Art Collection of Indian Affairs in Ottawa, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and the College of Indian American, American Indian Art in Santa Fe, he had worked to the Six Nations Confederacy with others to trace wampum in museums and private collections around the world and to return these to the Confederacy. I once asked Rick how many pieces of wampum he and other Haudenosaunee people like Orrin Lyons and Paul Williams had been involved in recovering since the 1970s. And I expected him to say what I thought would be a big number, 86 or something, 65. And he said, oh, I lost track in the 600s. We're talking about a significant domain of cultural memory, cultural knowledge, agreement making, legal history in the whole domain of wampum and its recovery. So what I'd like to do in the next stage of my talk is move to talking about wampum as relationship, knowledge as relationship. I'm introducing my story of coming to know about wampum through a series of relationships that emerged simply from living and working in the place where I am. Because this is literally how I became interested or even know anything about wampum and how I was challenged to envisage, engage with a knowledge system or an approach to knowledge that was previously unknown to me. Or to put it differently, an approach to knowledge that had been put beneath my notice. 
you see, my entire academic training had been premised on the objectivity of knowledge. The effort to secure something as reliable and true usually meant the scientific method, basically, of isolating the thing you were studying from a host of variables, including from your own subjective perception of them, and fixing it under your focus, and then providing analysis and understanding based on that stable, unchanging state. Yes, I was a literature scholar, which might seem like a softer approach to knowledge than, say, hard sciences, as some people put it. But the words I focused on in my field of study had been written in, down in books, so the things I studied were kind of fixed, at least on the page. I might animate them in my mind and even debate their meanings with others, but the source was a fairly stable object, visible to anybody who picked up the same page and looked at the same letters on that page. So to go back, wampum was different. The beads and designs woven into the two-row wampum or the covenant chain um, signified concepts and ideas. I'll keep this one in my hand. The beads and patterns were stable and permanent like letters on the page, but the meanings couldn't be animated by an individual studying them unassisted and on his own. They were formed in relationships and their meanings were passed on in the Haudenosaunee oral tradition by wampum keepers who had learned the story they conveyed from the previous generation and who passed on that story to the next generation. By this means, the meaning of these three wampum that I have on my slide, the dish with one spoon, the covenant chain of friendship and the two row wampum have been passed on to us over the course of more than 400 years. The iconographical way of passing on knowledge is inherently relational. You can see the relationship being conveyed in the wampum itself. It's relational knowledge. The two row is a relational set of uh, iconographical representations, yes? By this means, the, these wampum have been passed on to us for the course, over the course of more than 400 years. This iconographical way of passing on knowledge is relational, meaning that you can't just look at wampum and quotes, read it as an object. You must meet with and discuss it with others who share their understanding of it with you across time, across generations. The covenant chain, the one that I've been holding up here, for example, figures the relationship between the two partners who have linked arms, like siblings in a family. The Haudenosaunee and British speakers who repeated the story of the covenant chain agreement throughout the 18th century said that it began with the two parties linking arms and that this image evolved to using the rope that the British used to tie their ship to the shore to represent the link between the two peoples, the traveling people who are come from far away and yet who are bound to the people here by means of the rope that we both hold with between each other. They then considered that ropes can wear out. So they introduced the idea of an anchor chain linking the parties. And when they considered that iron would rust, they suggested the chain be made of silver, which meant that people referred to this wampum belt as the silver covenant chain of friendship. This understanding of the evolution of relationship, changing and adapting over time to new circumstances, shows in the fact that this agreement made between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch first, and then the British, was later extended to the Anishinaabe, Cherokee, Wabanaki Confederacy. So it was with incoming newcomers, as well as with surrounding indigenous confederacies and nations throughout the 17th, 18th, and into the 19th centuries. Wampum is, you could say, relational knowledge, a relational way of making, retaining, and passing on what we know. When wampum keepers bring out a previously agreed upon wampum for retelling, they call it polishing the agreement or sweeping off the dust of time to renew and revitalize its meaning. For them, wampum is relational knowing, a method of knowing things in ongoing, repeated dialogue. This approach to knowledge is quite different from the one I absorbed growing up in Western culture. And it's revealing that I only came to understand the limits of my own culture's way of knowing through relationship, meaning that by getting to know indigenous approaches to indigenous ways of knowing things, I could better see my own culture's ways of operating and its assumptions that were built into those. 
This is one of the huge gifts that comes from those of us from Western culture coming into relationship with indigenous ways of making relationship and ways of knowing. Just to demonstrate how broadly distributed this gift can be, I'll move out of my own geographical region of the Haudenosaunee territory around south of Hamilton where I live and move out of my uh, that region and talk about some thoughts from other indigenous thinkers from other regions who don't necessarily use wampum to anchor their thinking, culture, or story. So here's a first one from Evelyn Steinhauer, who's Cree, and talking about how Western knowledge as individual property is so different from the idea of knowledge as relational, as beyond the human even, relations beyond human beings, knowledge as therefore not just a set of properties, but as a set of responsibilities in that ongoing relationship making. Or here's Sean Wilson, also Cree, speaking about Western knowledge as the way it tends to isolate knowledge as an object versus indigenous knowledge as inherently relational and interactive in a book called Research as Ceremony, which I recommend if you haven't seen it. It makes you think differently about what knowledge is and how it's exchanged and what its functions are. Or Eber Hampton, who's Chickasaw, talking about how we can become dangerous when we pretend to objectify knowledge and attempt to deny our subjective interaction with it. In other words, he talks about the importance of understanding our own motivation in relation to the knowledges that we are interested in and pursuing. My own entry via the police on campus to an interest in wampum made these points very clear to me. The knowledge I was going to, uh, was gaining was born of relationships in the place where I live. And as Evelyn Steinhauer says, those relationships carried responsibilities with them, responsibilities to the bearers of knowledge themselves. I needed to learn about the wampum that conveyed these kinds of knowledge, how they were made by hand from seashells from the Atlantic coast, what their iconographical patterns meant, and so forth. And I also learned my responsibilities to the people who created them and imbued them with these meanings. The people who held up the two-row wampum in 2006 back there, that's where the two-row wampum is in the room here, to resist the police enforcement of developers' right to build on contested indigenous land. One of the things I should just pause in and say, among the many, many wampum that um, Rick Hill was saying that he's been involved in recovering. I've focused especially on the wampum that were officially made with newcomers. They were forms of dialogue meant to be engaged with Europeans and so on. They are the ones that were asking for our interaction. If these are seen as the property or the, the uh, ret remain, remaining signs of past relationships should have no engagement with us, or if we don't uptake them, how can they be living uh, engagements with the present as we were being told when the police were on the campus and the land claim was taking place in 2006. So as Steinhauer and Wilson and Hampton indicated, however, there's a long history of denying knowledge as a living relationship and trying to contain it as an object that individuals and institutions can neutralize and possess of knowledge as a property individuals and institutions can control, cut off from the ongoing relationship that keep them alive. So I'm gonna shift in this part of my talk to going back to my own region and the wampum relations that are so central to its political and cultural life. For shorthand sake, I'll just say that the living relationship with indigenous people was seen less and less relevant to the emerging settler colonial states of the United States and Canada after the War of 1812 in particular and the consolidation of military and bureaucratic power of these new nation states such that they no longer depended as heavily on indigenous allies to maintain themselves as viable states. During this period, and especially after the conclusion of the American Civil War, both nation states developed the draconian bureaucracies of Indian affairs premised on the belief that indigenous people were a waning or a dying race who would be bypassed by social progress and quote, civilization. Indian policies of the late 19th and early 20th centuries then explicitly anticipated the death of indigenous peoples and knowledges 
and they spurred on this genocidal dream by reducing indigenous peoples from necessary allies and friends and covenant holders to wards of the state and putting their children in residential schools where they literally either died or were forcibly educated to become as white and European as possible. Interestingly, this is also the period when anthropology becomes an academic discipline. Indeed, some of the earliest texts in the discipline of anthropology, such as Lewis Henry Morgan's League of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois, are studies of Haudenosaunee knowledge and ways of being during this period of late 19th and early 20th centuries. The problem is that much of this research was interpreted with the dying culture paradigm of colonial social Darwinism that could not imagine a living contemporary relationship to Wampum, nor a responsibility to the people and knowledge systems it conveys. And let me give a couple of examples of this kind of work. In 1898, after a hundred years during which state intervention had divided the Six Nations Confederacy between the United States and Canada, when the system of passing on Wampum knowledge from one generation to the next had been cut off by residential schooling and the interpretation of self-government within the Confederacy, demoralized chiefs in Onondaga, New York, signed over the role of wampum keeper to the New York State Museum in Albany. And the resulting wampum law that made it therefore illegal for anyone, including Six Nations people, to hold wampum. This was in the effort to, quote, preserve the few remaining wampum from being sold to private dealers or other museums and being dispersed around the world. The New York State Museum remained Wampum's official custodian until the 1970s, when indigenous sovereigntists began to agitate for the Wampum to be returned to their cultural home. William Fenton, known among his anthropology colleagues as the Dean of Iroquoian Studies, was alarmed that members of the state government were open to decommissioning the New York State Museum from its role as wampum keeper and to returning the 20-some belts in its possession to the chiefs of Onondaga, New York. In the heat of the argument in 1971, he published an article entitled The New York State Wampum Collection, The Case for the Integrity of Cultural Treasures. What's sad and revealing about Fenton's article is that by this point in his career, he had established an international scholarly expertise on all things Haudenosaunee. He'd given himself to deep lifelong immersion in studying the history, culture, knowledge, and social arrangements of Six Nations. He'd interviewed and personally met hundreds of Haudenosaunee elders, clan mothers, knowledge keepers, and researchers. And in his own wording, he saw wampum belts as cultural treasures of immense value. But his approach to what he learned actively sought or worked to isolate wampum belts from living vital relation in the present. Instead, to preserve them as objects, representing a now extinct past. And he did this by asserting that the Six Nations Confederacy as a viable political body was dead and its rest restoration was only a romantic delusion of indigenous political agitators. He did this by providing evidence for the Confederacy's expiration by observing that the Onondaga leaders of the 1890s who had signed over wampum preservation to the New York State Museum no longer maintained the tradition of passing on wampum stories from one generation to the next. So he was convinced they didn't know what the wampum signified anymore. And he insisted that they themselves saw the wampum belts only as artifacts of an unknown and unknowable past. Thus the knowledge associated with wampum belts was dead. Furthermore, Fenton pointed out how the dysfunction of Six Nations leadership meant not only that their chiefs and leaders willingly signed over the guardianship of the wampum belts, but also that they no longer had the wherewithal to take proper care of the ancient and fragile bead belts. For all these reasons, Fenton argued, the New York State Museum should maintain these cultural treasures, not so that they could renew relationships between New Yorkers and Haudenosaunee people, but so that schools, tours, and scholars could come and view these objects as records of a fascinating but bygone and irrecoverable past. I'm not saying Fenton was wrong in all of these assertions, 
the New York State Museum did have better facilities for preserving wampum than Onondagas did at the time. And I'm showing you have since built museums in their own territory to look after wampum, but at the time, those didn't exist. And the late 19th century chiefs had indeed lost a good deal of their cultural knowledge and did sell off wampum to less than ideal buyers. Just by the way, that among them who sold wampum was Pauline Johnson, the famous uh, poet who was from Six Nations. Maybe these are stories you know. But the thing that runs throughout this logic, uh, Fenton assumed with the mainstream of Western thinking, that wampum is a material object that can be studied, that the researcher could remain dispassionately and uh, objective about its meanings, and that as a passive object, it needs to be preserved and protected by professionals who have no living relationship with it or the communities who created it, other than preserving its status as an object. For him, the relationships represented by wampum were dead, concluded, and fixed cultural treasures. This way of relating to what we know as dead is not just a practice from long ago. So I've sketched it out in relation to Fenton's relationship to wampum in the 1970s. But you can see a similar approach to wampum much more recently in current scholarship. For example, in a 2010 article on wampum, the transfer and creation of rituals on the early American frontier, non-Indigenous wampum scholar Paul Otto emphasizes wampum's relational power when he looks back to the era of colonial contact between Indigenous peoples and Europeans and observes that due to wampum's cultural value, I'm quoting in here, that emphasized social exchange, including building and maintaining reciprocal relationships, Native Americans used wampum in a wide range of rituals from simple exchanges of friendship to complex negotiations of intertribal diplomacy with the goal of social cohesion. And those were living intercultural interrelationships, he notes, since these rituals originated with native people, which eventually, but eventually became common practice in meetings between Europeans and Indians, and also included elements of European diplomatic practice, wampum stood at the center of this evolving frontier diplomacy. In statements like these, you can see that Otto understands how wampum relationships extended and adapted from context to context, from group to group. He goes on to trace how wampum entered into European languages in order to demonstrate how the relationships wampum generated and symbolized became part of Euro-American everyday vocabulary. So the French thought that the beads that they saw uh, looked like ones they'd seen from Marco Polo coming from China, and they called wampum porcelain, porcelain. While the, French, the Dutch uh, Dutch adopted an East Coast Algonquian term and called it Tuan, while the British shortened the name of the Wampum Pierg people who made beads from seashells on the Atlantic coast and traded inland, and sometimes the British called it Pierg, but most often Wampum, the word I'm using now that has come, become common in the English language. Otto also traces Wampum's evolution by noting that Europeans in America came to use Wampum themselves to affirm living arrangements with indigenous trading partners and allies. So the Dutch, for example, commissioned wampum to be made for these purposes when they met with the Haudenosaunee and others in 1659. Or the Americans then make the same practice over hundred years later when they had wampum made to represent the Fort Stanwix Treaty. One of the biggest wampums ever made is called the George Washington Belt. That he can commission at the close of the Revolutionary War to reestablish relations with the Haudenosaunee. Wampum was so important in 17th and 18th century America, Otto says, that there was a glass wampum bead making factory by the Cam run by the Campbell Company in what's today New Jersey. So Europeans were very active in the whole business of wampum making and wampum exchange. But then, for some reason, Otto says that after 1800, the rituals of frontier diplomacy centering upon wampum belt ended. This, despite the British giving a pledge of the Crown Wampum Belt to their Six Nations allies at the conclusion of the War of 1812 at Burlington Heights, which is in Hamilton, where I live. Um, or more recently, Jake Thomas, Chief Jake Thomas, presenting orations of the two-row and covenant chain wampum belts to Governor General Schreier in the 1980s, 
forward. We've got another photo here of Assembly of First Nations Chief Sean Atlio presenting a covenant chain wampum to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and Governor General David Johnson in 2012. Or closer to home, closer to me, Six Nations Polytechnic presenting an adopted covenant chain wampum. This one, including the students, we mutually serve between the two sides of the two rows at the top uh, belt up there. The McMaster University stands over the door of our council chambers for center meetings. Essentially, Otto sees wampum as vital to the formation and maintenance of the living intercultural international relationships in, in the Northeast throughout the earlier early colonial era, but then pronounces it dead by 1800. When the colonial nation states began to ignore the relationships they had made via wampum with indigenous allies. You can see a sign of what this does to his own relationship to wampum knowledge in his article, in that his article surveys the living relationship solely in European languages and what words they used for wampum, uh, porcelain, sewer, wampum, wampum here. This, and never once thinks to ask a living Haudenosaunee person, what are your words for wampum? What are those words and how do they remain in circulation today? This approach to the field of study makes them never think to engage in a living relationship with people who think about wampum and live with its effects to this day. He seeks and carefully catalogs it contained in colonial records and European languages alone. And when it falls in frequency in those records, he assumes that that means the relationship ended. All this to say, in regard to Fenton and Otto's way of studying wampum, it matters how we relate to the knowledges we encounter. If we think it's dead, cut it off cut off from current world of living relationships, we can actually reinforce its killing. If, however, we understand it as alive, as living in a current set of relationships, to which, or perhaps I should say, to whom we have responsibilities, it gains vitality and relevance. We can relate to it as a dead object or as part of life's ongoing cycle, as a seed for ongoing change. So I'd like to move to a section where I talk about regenerating the river of wampum knowledge. The Haudenosaunee word for wampum belt, Daswenta, contains the idea of flow, kind of like a river flow. And you can see the way wampum itself flows. It's got a ripple mode and it, and it, go, it travels. There's kind of a sense of traveling time or traveling relationship in the form of wampum itself. Picture those two boats traveling on the river, uh, side by side down the river of life, or the continuity of relationships uh, in the rope connecting the two human figures of the covenant chain. Wampum were woven into belts that were continu con continuous and flexible, like the flow of a river, which gives life to everything around it. Oh, I'm already on this slide. Good. Kelsey Leonard is a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Waters, Climate and Sustainability at University of Waterloo. And she's from the Shinnecock Nation on the Atlantic coast in the USA who are traditional wampum makers and from whom the Haudenosaunee would have traded for the whelk and quahog shell beads from which they wove the white and then the purple beads. In an article called Wanum Wash, Wampum Justice, Dr. Leonard explains that the Quahog and Welk mollusks are known in their language as truth tellers because they filter the water through their bodies in order to survive. In so doing, they purify the water, making it clear, something you can see into easily. More than this, if you wanna know what's truly in the water, you look in their bodies where you will find its contents. One of the first places to look for pollution or contamination for harm in the water is in the bodies of these mollusks. To this day, she says, marine biologists look there to see what's happening in our oceans. For this reason, in her language, wampum wash is said after a wampum speech to remind everyone that we're here to tell the truth, to clarify what's really going on amongst the group in our midst. The beads in the wampum themselves are made from the bodies of nature's truth tellers. In the presence 
of these wampum truth tellers. We are responsible to speak with truth in our hearts and minds. We too are filtering what we are encountering. The truth or the clarity of the environment we're in depends on how we take in and retain what we have encountered in this relational context. When did the truth spoken by mollusks end? When did it die? The beads made of their bodies may be ancient. They may have been kept in glass cases for a century in the New York State Museum, but the truth telling of the wampum is still physically present for anyone who has ears to hear. And so the Haudenosaunee have never accepted the death of wampum, nor have they accepted the demise of relationships, the agreements, internal or external, that they were created to convey. So I'm happy to say that Fenton's argument for keeping the wampum locked away in the museum didn't win the day, and there have been and continue to be periodic ceremonies of repatriation from institutions from the New York State Museum to the Smithsonian Institute to the American Philosophical Society who have returned wampum to traditional keepers in New York State and to Dale Hahage at the Grand River. The slides on this PowerPoint record the chiefs at Grand River receiving 11 wampum from the Smithsonian Institute in 1988 and knowledge holders such as Jacob Thomas, Yuga speaker and adjunct professor at Trent University, providing orations of the covenant chain and the two row wampum belts at Grand River and with a delegation of chiefs with the governor general in Ottawa. By the way, the one in Ottawa, uh, the bottom slide, that's just at the time when the Canadian constitution is being not negotiated to 1982 in the repatriated constitution. So the reason why they went with the covenant chain and two row wampums to talk to Canada at that time for the government and the government general was to intervene in the whole process of constitution making. Every year for the past decade, Six Nation elders meet at a different Haudenosaunee community throughout the 18 communities scattered across New York, Ontario, Quebec, and as far west as Wisconsin for recitations of the great law of peace, often referred to as the constitution of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Those who retain wampum knowledge passed on from their elders, as well as from research that they have conducted in archives and libraries, recite what they know, comparing the different versions that have been retained in different communities, all in the effort to polish the chain of their Confederacy wampum agreements. These are all moments of polishing the chain, dusting off the beads in the effort to remind people of the ongoing flow of wampum relations. I'm going to try to illustrate the ongoing relevance of the living flow of our own contemporary relations with reference to Onondaga Chief Irving Paulus Jr.'s way of speaking about the two-row wampum in particular, that same one that I kept hearing about after the 30 police cars were at McMaster campus and the 200 officers raided the Douglas Street State land dispute. If you don't know treaty, Chief Paulus says, you don't know that you're the other half of treaties. We have treaty obligations to you. You have obligations to us. Reminding us that the treaties didn't somehow magically end when our ancestors turned away from honoring them. The treaties are alive. They have never been rescinded. They continue to filter the experience, the world in which we live. And when Chief Paulus dusts off the beads of the two-row wampum agreement, he emphasizes its ecological obligation. The two-row wampum, he says, you must obey the natural laws and you must obi abide by the mandates that we have as members of the Onondaga Nation of the Haudenosaunee. And that is to respect Mother Earth, the trees, the animals, the fish, the air, the waters, the plants, and the medicine. The agreement was for the health of the river. Reminding us of the respect for each vessel's culture, beliefs, and laws and the river of life, he says, since the Europeans moved into our territory in 1788, they have polluted the land. They have violated this treaty. They did not live by these agreements that we have made. And so I present to you now this treaty. And if the ones before us have polluted, we'll try to restore it to what it used to be. Keith Paulus sees the knowledge conveyed by the two-row wampum agreement from the 1600s as absolutely relevant to our times. He repolishes its living message in a way that perhaps our Western sailing, sailing ship is a bit better able to hear as our understanding of human-made climate change 
throne. The wealth and the quahog beads are telling us their truths about what we have washed down our drains unthinkingly, about what we are putting into the landfills or digging out of it and burning into the air. The wampum belts exchanged between peoples of the Northeast and with incoming Europeans of the 17th and 18th century, come to think of it, were also finally about the living ecosystem on which they all depended. Could there be a dish with one spoon where all could receive what they needed in peace? Or would there always be a knife hidden in the dish? And would the dish uh, itself be sustainable for future generations? Whether it was negotiating a sustainable fur trade or if it's negotiating the rights to clean water, clean air, protected trees or a farmable land today, we cannot pretend the relationships are dead, that the wampum belts are relics of an unreachable past. And we need not wait for governments or even corporations to re-enter these living relationships with good minds and respect and reciprocity. We can go about the work of regenerating these living relationships in the niches within which we live and work. I'd like to give you just a couple of uh, an example of this kind of work of being carried out now. So since I began the talk with my uh, introduction to Wampum through the conflict at uh, Douglas Creek Estates, Here's a project that also drew out of that period when Mohawk teacher Susie O'Miller, who taught on the Grand River Reserve, contacted teachers like settler Canadian uh, uh, teacher Scott Cooper, who was teaching in the embattled town of Caledonia on the two sides of the land conflict. They dreamed up a pen pal project to help students on opposite sides of the conflict to know one another as people, as students, as children. After the students had traded letters back and forth for a while, they felt that it would be a good idea for the children to meet. And so they organized an exhibition of art both sets of students had made about their understanding of the two-year wampum. The students met each other so they could make living face-to-face -face relationships. The idea grew. Each year for 10 years, students in new classes exchanged letters and emails and then they met for activities such as exhibiting their art, playing indoor games and learning tricks you can do with a yo-yo. That kind of freaks me out when I think of 2000 kids with yo-yos, but I think everybody lived. The PowerPoint image I'm showing you here is a helicopter photo of 2000 students dressed in purple and white t-shirts lined up in the shape of a two row in, in Battlefield Park in Hamilton. Think of how these kids will understand the knowledge conveyed by Wampum. Think of what they had to say to their parents when they went home from school that day with their two-year-old teacher on. What I've learned from my encounter with Wampum was that it matters how you relate to the knowledge you learn, the things you know. If you think of it as a thing, as an object, even as one that needs protection and for good reasons, you run the risk of strangling it, of making it a property or a possession rather than a living being that calls up a response, response ability from you. From Wampum, I've learned that what I know is a relationship. No, a whole ecosystem of relationships. It flows and keeps on going. It doesn't stop or die, even when it's repressed or locked away for a long time. Like water, it soaks this into the surface. It feeds the roots of new life, new relationships. Like a seed, Hawkins bean, it grows with new lives, new roots. So I can trace its flow over time. I can respond to the relationships it raises, but I can't contain it in a vault or a case. And I can't pretend I can live somehow ignorant of its current life, the relationships it currently enables. For Wampum is a reminder that things we know are themselves alive, that they are truth tellers of themselves re-energize, they can re-energize their lives when we relate to them as living equals. When we get to know something about their internal lives, we realize that they are truth tellers about what's in the water, what's in the air, what's in the ecosystem all around them. Wampum reminds us that knowledge is not a thing or a set of data, but a river of living relationships. There's so much still to learn about the river of wampum, so none of us can ever feel like we've got a place there, that we've learned what there is to know. But there, that's because it's a never-ending, evolving, intergenerational flow of unfolding relationships. 
quantum can help us align with that flow, with the wisdom there is in learning to live in peace, friendship, respect, and the river of life. I'm so grateful to live in a region where the people who understood this way of doing knowledge, who understood relationships, and who understood the world we live in so profoundly, we practically formulated these ideas and willing to share them with our ancestors. And I'm especially grateful that they refused to give in to the attempted epistemicide of dead object thinking, and that they continue to share these understandings with any of us who are willing to listen, among whom are you. Thank you for listening to me today and for continuing the flow by doing so. And I'm very glad to, I don't know how much time we have for conversation. Oh, great. So um, I'm really glad to hear your thoughts or maybe your knowledges of wampum in your, you know, in your experience. Uh, questions you may have, glad to interact with you and what emerges for you to think about together. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, I, that appreciation that I chose these particular wampum to talk about today, and is there quite a different style of creation of wampum to ones that might not have been shaped for European um, interact into the future? And um, one thing to say is that the purple uh, become those shells are very hard, and so it was before the arrival of metal drills. You, you, these were made out of shells with hand drills or bow drills. So imagine the labor of making one bead, let alone a whole belt of them. Uh, and so the purple beads got easier to make once Europeans were in the region, which means that there's a lot more purple belts and belts that have more purple in them post uh, European arrival. Uh, Another thing to say is that some of the, the earliest story I know of wampum making, I love this story, so I've got to tell it. So uh, it's the story of Hiawatha, that his name was abused by Longfellow into something that is unrecognizable from Haudenosaunee people. But the story of Hiawatha is that he had lost his family uh, and he was deep in grief. There had been a series of deaths, daughters and his partner. And he went wandering into the woods, uh, deep in grief. It, say, it says that his heart lay on the ground. Eventually, he emerges into a shelter on the edge of the cornfield of a night of people. And at this time, the law of peace hasn't arrived. So these are warring peoples. It's dangerous to show up unannounced on somebody else's margins. And so he steps into somebody's, I guess it would be a corn drying shed or something. And sets a fire and he's so distraught that he doesn't really know what he's doing. He just finds himself carving tubes out of twigs um, and just mesmerized by the physical activity itself and then starts threading them on strings of, I don't know, weed grass or some kind of weed grass or something that he strings these together. And uh, sentinels from the village see him out there and come out and say, Hey, what are you doing in the, in the region? And he's so mesmerized with his activity that he doesn't even interact with them. He doesn't hear them. It's so dangerous. You know, he could lose his life being here, but he's so fascinated with the making of, of these twigs and into beads that he's making, fashioning into tubes and the activity of it that he doesn't even really know. Them. And then eventually the head person of the village says to the sentinel, Ah, I mean, they've been back and forth two or three times. So he says, I think I know what to do. So he makes a string of wampum himself. I'm calling it wampum. He makes some tubes onto a string and then says, take this out to him. And you take it out to him and goes, oh, you're talking to me. Let's, uh, you know, please come into our village and explain yourself. So part of this story that interests me, and this becomes part of Haudenosaunee early wampum string 
not bead making, is that there's a ceremony known as the condolence that grows out of this story of being so lost in grief, you don't even know your own mind. You know, you, you're, it's a welter of emotion. And the thing about beading, of making beads, and just one thing at a time on a string is a way of taking the mess and just centering oneself, getting into a better mind. Not just that, but it really helps when somebody else says, I see what you're doing and I understand it in some way. And here's my effort to communicate that back to you. So the dialogical nature, they like often call it invitation wampum now, where people will send a wampum to say, let's have a meeting in four days. And here's how many deeds and here's, so there's a whole elaboration of kinds of wampum for different meeting practices that grow out of this sense of addressing grief, the confused mind, and organizing that mind so that it can listen properly. So one of the functions of these is to pass a wampum belt to somebody on the other side of the fire, for them to hear what the message is and to understand what all the parts of it are, and then to repeat it back, because it's meant to be dialogical from the start. It's not just um, that I speak myself and then you hear the speech and off you go. So back to your question, were there other forms of wampum that weren't for um, Europeans? Yes, many, more than the, many, many more than the ones I'm talking about today. I've always felt that the, especially the ones that are for ceremonial purposes and that are within in the Haudenosaunee culture, it's not for a person for me to talk about. But the other side of it is the ones that were for Europeans, we need to be talking about them. It's not a dialogue. If, Somebody makes wampum, proclaims its meaning, and nobody picks it up. So that's the lively domain of wampum uh, dialogue. Thanks for the question. Well, one other thing to add about how Europeans' uh, technology was helpful in the making of wampum, that fascinates me too about, you can think of these things as like culturally proprietorial, you know, this is a, way of doing things from Haudenosaunee culture and how readily Haudenosaunee people said, hey, there's a European thing, let's bring that into the way we do this. So that it becomes an interactive dialogical form, culturally dialogical, very early, not just you know recently. That's another kind of footnote to the whole exchange of, of wampum and history. Other thoughts or comments or observations? Yeah. Well, this is, I've heard people debate this. So the strings at the end, uh, you know, especially, do we have the two row up there? Um, thank you. So I've heard people say that if you join these together, you have an unbroken eternal circle. These, uh, and then these strings can tie it together. So uh, belt, as a worn thing. There's a really fascinating, if you're interested in wampum study, there's this amazing scene in the Jesuit relations, 1645, Georges arrives at, maybe you know this story, at uh, Trois-Rivières, and the French recorders at the moment say he was wearing 17 colliers de porcelain, um, colliers de porcelain. Um, so people didn't you know, think of, if you're, on a diplomatic mission, you've got a whole bunch of them to carry. How do you carry it? Maybe around your body, you know, someone, I've seen photographs of people wearing them almost like sashes, people, people wearing them as belts. Um, whether they were meant to be that way, I don't know if it was a convenience for the carrier, but in this scene, it says that he was wearing seven, he, had, he was wearing about 10 of the ones he had. He was glittering from head to toe. And then he had another satchel where he had more wampum. And in this exchange, this is negotiating prisoner exchanges between the French Huroni and Wendat Alliance and the Haudenosaunee. Um, he uh, hangs a cord across two sticks, presents each oration. You might almost think of it as diplomatic speech making that's like a play with 16 acts, 17 acts. And as he completes each part of the speech, he hangs it over the cord. That, if you think about it as an interlingual moment, 
how do you make sure that everybody understood what you were saying and carefully hang each one over after you've spoken about its meaning and its significance and so on? It's part of a like a dramatization when they speak of Yogitone speaking as if he was almost singing. So he's it's like a oratorical high form of language use, rhythmic and rhetorical in that sense, so that it would be easy for people with related but different languages to hear. And then once he's done this for like a day and a half, like it's not 10 minutes, um, Couture, uh, who's being returned as a prisoner, has been living, living with the Haudenosaunee for a couple of years, so he knows some language. He then presents belts made by the French Wendat and Alliance in response to every single one. So there's like one wampum, one wampum, one wampum for a day and a half. And then the response is very clear. Did we understand? Did they get it? How much of a shared understanding has been developing over these days? Um, I was reading a scholar who said that those belts, just doing a rough calculation, are about 30,000 beads. And you think everyone was made, you know, with a hand drill woven, like the magnificence and you could say cultural wealth uh, meant to impress the other people who are part of the endeavor is a massive undertaking. So Yojitone doesn't just get to go there and say what he wants to say. You know, there's a whole lot of people who thought, what is the belt that you're going to present? Wampum makers have made the beads and then woven them into these strings. There's beaders work. That's part of the whole uh, domain. They've thought about what are the messages we're commissioning this guy to convey. And stuff like that. I have that concern about the work I do every day, you know, because it's so easy to be doing a lot of work, learning something, and then conveying it as if it's yours. Like all the things I've been saying to you today, I didn't invent these ways of thinking and learning about them, but because I'm saying them, then you're the person at the front of the room saying, you know, being perceived as the holder of this way of knowing. And so it is a concern. How do you keep a respectful relationship with the knowledge traditions and the people who hold that? Uh, and one of the things I would say is, if you know beaters who have, that's their, from their tradition, you can participate, then they can teach beating their way. And your students get a chance to learn what is the way of thinking, like, we all know we're this post pandemic and how much anxiety is in our own lives, let alone student life and all around us. These kind of hand making methods are a way of just saying this thing. And for this half hour while I'm in this workshop, I don't have to think of, you know, am I going to be able to afford my rent or am I going to get an A in the class? And I can just make this be. Follow the stitch. Those are incredibly deep practices that can like make our knowledge physical rather than the stuff that we circulate in the world. So there are cultural traditions who understand that. And when you think about why do some cultures have such amazing beating practices, they come out of those understandings. So bringing somebody like that to campus or building a relationship with people in your region who do that kind of work would be amazing. And you think about beating in particular, there's some obviously very strong indigenous beating practices, but you know, people use rosaries for a long time in European culture. What, what is that um, practice of going through the beads and getting your mind to settle from all of the welfare and stuff? It's a very similar but different cultural tradition. So, yeah, please keep keep going in that direction. It sounds amazing to me. Yeah, good. Thank you. I mean, one of them is I bring wampum to classes and we talk with students about these things um, to give my own story of shifting knowledge traditions and knowledge. But the other things are, you know, being super active in the university, trying to say who is expertise and how do we have other people. Um, besides folks trained like me at the front of the room. So that's been my whole like supervisory trajectory in terms of what kinds of students who are upcoming and becoming professors on the side. Um, so that's a whole thing about like institutional engagement and thinking what is the future of an education 
Um, so just to give you practical, there's costs and worrisome things. I plan to retire next year and I am retiring alongside the only other person that teaches Canadian literature in my department. No departments are getting hired, for any, it seems, these days. I doubt anybody will you know, be hired into that field. Um, so as one of my students, who is Mohawk, I said, are the wheels falling off the bus? You know, like, what are we going to do? And I said, but you're going to teach whatever I thought I was teaching. I called it Canadian literature. What you call it is going to be up to you. And that's maybe going to be quite different in its nomination and uh, set of relationships and the ecosystem of knowledge to perceive. And in this person's case, they'll be able to teach it in a way that I could never have done. So I kind of feel like that's an intergenerational relational thing that's ongoing. I think we're all in that, don't you think? Like in your institution, whatever part you're in, you kind of feel like, well, the way we've done it is kind of like this. And there's all these pressures to readjust. And we're thinking, okay, so how are we going to convey relevant knowledge and both historical and contemporary, so that new generations can see its relevance and liveliness for the world that's coming. And um, so, I don't, I don't know if uh, that's answering your question very well, but I, it's part of uh, every day for me. Um, it's also part of my research. I, I have a book I've edited with some Haudenosaunee colleagues of all writers from Grand River Territory on the, the quotation I was making on Wamanush, the truth-telling nature of beads, comes from the book that hasn't been published yet. It's all collected work of both community-based and university-based Haudenosaunee scholars talking about the history of the two and coming And then I'm writing sort of my own material. Yeah, it's, I don't know. Uh, I do feel like it's, maybe that's the, the tricky thing about thinking of knowledge as a living thing is that you're, you're always kind of in this adaptation. I don't know where this is going way because it's evolving with the learning as it unfolds and with the, particularly the relationships that emerge. As I say, like you, I grew up in the West Grand Canada. I didn't know about Wampum tradition. And then it's the region I was in that was saying, you have to pay attention to this. The police are in your neighborhood. Um, what does this mean? Why, you know, like, what's happening to your students and your faculty colleagues? Those things made me have to learn things that I had attended to. Any other thoughts or questions? Or, yes. Yeah. This is a, that's an interesting question. And there's really lively discussions these days between uh, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people in particular, scholars, talking about wampum history, because that was some of the most regular exchanges of wampum. So Alan Corbier is uh, he's a professor here at, well, at York, as well as um, director of the Anishinaabe Knowledge Center up at Manitoulin, and has done a whole lot of work on wampum history. Um, and Rick Hill, who I've been talking to, they've, they've had a lot of exchange. So there are resource people who can help facilitate some of the background or the contextual relational knowledge of these things. And that's going to get this richer, uh, this collection that I'm talking about, my 10 contributors, 12 contributors who have different kinds of, I'll go back to um, uh, the Shinnegok scholar, um, who taught Kelsey Leonard, who talks about the making of wampum, and her people are East Coast uh, wampum makers, not Haudenosaunee and not Anishinaabe. So there's knowledge of these things from very different cultures, and I guess it's building the relationship, um, connecting with the people who do know and saying, okay, we have these things, uh, and what, what are the community connections we can rebuild around those, if you want to call it material objects that uh, the community people may know about and have context for. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the uh, living relational element as compared to the maintaining an object element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's 
two things. So just in case everybody couldn't hear, there's an object from Inca tradition that's held at the library where we were and at McGill. And uh, its provenance and knowledge associated with it is not known. Um, and has that happened to Wampum but from the Haudenosaunee tradition and other traditions? And you know, what do we do in that circumstance? So to go back to the era of the New York State Museum and so on, um, it was a perceived loss of knowledge. Uh, and so often and always there are, you know, when we perceive who is an expert, who is the person who knows, we go to find out from them and they say, well, I don't know. And then we think that's the end of the story. And then of course, there, there are people who know in a different neighborhood or a different thing and that emerged as you could say political organizing of the 70s when indigenous people emerged from a long period of so much suppress suppression that people got to know one another in different regions. And still to this day, as I was saying, every year there's a meeting of people who talk about the great law and say, what one from you guys know? What are your stories about them? How do they compare to the stories we have? And how does that compare to what we read from Fenton in the <laughs> library system? So there's, there's active regeneration of knowledge that's been lost. But I've also heard Rick Hill say that thing about, you know, our idea of what is a knowledge thing? Um, what is a maintainer of knowledge or of data? And he was saying, those beads are alive. They're still talking. If we can attend to them, we'll still listen. I'm thinking, I don't know what you're talking about, Rick. You're past me at this point. So there's a different sense of what kind of information is being carried and how it is in Wampum that I will frankly say is beyond my know knowing. Um, I'll be interested to see how they say it is because you never know when somebody says, I know that there's knowledge in here and has a conversation with other people about it, what does come up? And maybe there is knowledge retained. So that's one thing. Um, but there are some Wampum that have, have been lost. Sometimes it's because um, the generation over time, you know, part of the belt, not, you don't know exactly which belt it was, so you're kind of guessing. Or here's, here's one that's kind of fascinating to me. The British made wampum that they gave to the Haudenosaunee at the end of the 1812 war. There's a record of what the chief who received the belt understood it to mean. But the British made it. So what they meant by it is, you know, it's interesting. There were so meticulous record keepers and then didn't keep track of that one, which makes you wonder what was going on. But it's, uh, so there are European made ones that were not exactly sure what they meant. And gathering the uh, people in the community, people have a bit of stories of what happened at the end of the 1812, what they think you contribute, but it's still uncertain about things like that. Beyond that, I guess I would just say that uh, tr trusting that if knowledge is a living relationship, that there, there may be things that remain. Mm -hmm. uh, we might not know it today. Uh, artificial intelligence may not find it if it's not on the web, you know, <laughs> but just holding a sense that there could be a living relationship. Maybe a form of respect is to say uh, this, this thing is important in connecting the communities that do research or that think about those objects. And of course, and of course, and what do uh, you all know? There's been long processes of significant archives and museums returning to communities and people coming and being able to say, well, you didn't know that's what it was that we know. So who knows what to do?